Uh, hi, good afternoon everyone. This is Rajiv S. Khanna from immigration.com, the losses of Rajiv S. Khanna PC. This is our bi-weekly community conference call every other Thursday. Today is August 11th. You heard the standard disclaimers and cautions when you logged into the call. This does not create an attorney-client relationship and the information is being presented to the best of our knowledge, ability and belief. You cannot rely upon it unless you go for a one-on-one -on -one consultation. You can tweet to me if you like. I have my Twitter window open while we are talking. Uh, join us on our Facebook page. It's a fairly active Facebook page as well and Google as well. So let me close these pages. We don't really need them. Let's get started beginning with the frequently asked questions first. I have, there are certain questions I mark as frequently asked questions. I'll go over them first. I'll invite follow-ups on those questions. Then we'll do all the posted questions. And if time permits, we'll do new questions. First frequently asked questions, the question is, a Canadian citizen or any person getting married to a US green card holder? What is the difference between getting married to a U.S. green card holder and a U.S. citizen? The big difference is that for a U.S. citizen spouse, staying here while waiting for the green card is not a problem. Being immediate relatives, just like parents of U.S. citizens are also immediate relatives, spouses of U.S. citizens are not subject to any quota, so there is no waiting time. Whereas spouses of green card holders depending upon where they were born, could be subject to a few months to a few years waiting. And while they are waiting for their dates to get mature, they have no right to stay in the United States. Spouse of a U.S. citizen or a parent of a U.S. citizen, no problem. But spouse of a green card holder cannot stay in the United States while they are waiting for their dates to become current. Of course, they can if they have independent grounds for staying like an H-1 visa or an L-1 visa, that's fine. But the mere filing of the green card does not give them a right to stay. So let's go over the questions. After marriage, can the Canadian citizen stay in the USA based upon Canadian citizenship credentials? And the answer is no. Canadian citizens are not allowed to stay in the US indefinitely. They are allowed to come in without visas for most things except TN, I'm sorry, not TN, except E2, I believe, and uh, probably E1 as well. I don't remember if there's a treaty with Canada on E1, but E2 for sure need visas. Otherwise, if you are a Canadian, you have an H1, L1, TN, you don't need a visa through the consulate. You just come to the airport or to the border and you get admitted. Do I need to apply for a family-based green card for the prospective spouse? And the answer is yes, of course. Can the Canadian citizen apply for USA jobs based upon Canadian citizenship credentials? No. And also a NAFTA visa, which is a TN visa, is very difficult if you already have a green card pending or your spouse is a US, US green card holder. I think what makes sense is probably an H1, L1 type visa which is not subject to the problems that are normally associated with the filing of a green card, or they can wait outside for the green card to be processed. They may be allowed in as long as they are completely upfront about it. When you come to the border as a Canadian citizen and you're going to visit your, your spouse who's a green card holder, you should tell them that's what you're going for. Do not say that I'm just going for a casual visit. And you can also tell them that I've done this before and I'm going to come back. They may allow you, they may not allow you at, at the border or the airport, but that's the only choice you have as far as I can see. So H1, L1 visa type visas, which are immune from a green card filing or coming for short, short visits on a tourist visa. And Canadians don't need a, really a visa, a tourist permission, I should say. Okay, any follow-up questions on this uh, that I have discussed, press star 5 on your telephone if you have any follow-up questions on this. Okay, there's one. Let's select. 
Indiana, yeah. Indiana, go ahead, please. So, so in this case, uh, can a Canadian citizen keep visiting, as you said, uh, every six months or whatever is the case, uh, and keep being upfront to the border, border force saying that uh, visiting your spouse? Is that permissible? Yes, there, uh, a- absolutely. That is permissible. Is that feasible? Is it going to work out? It really is a matter of discretion of the Customs and Border Protection officer who interviews her. But definitely it is legal. Just make sure that full disclosures are made to the government. That's all. And the second question is now, when applying for the family-based uh, green card visa, does it depend on the citizenship of the, the spouse, in this case Canadian citizenship, or the person sponsoring, which is the Indian citizen? Uh, are you saying to which to which country they are chargeable? Is that what you're saying? That yeah, yeah. well, that yeah. that yeah. always goes goes by the country of birth. Oh, okay. It doesn't go by the country of citizenship, and it goes by the country of the birth of the person you are sponsoring. Okay, got it. Got it. So if you got married to a French-born person, even though they are a citizen of India, they'll be charged to France. Okay. Good luck. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. All right. Let's go on to the next frequently asked question. Consequences of denial of an H1 transfer petition. This question comes up quite frequently that if I have an H1 transfer going and I join that employer, what is what are the consequences of H1 transfer being denied? Uh, for instance, can I go back and work for the old employer? And the answer is, we used to think not, but the latest, there was a memo from USCIS, or was it a part of the regulations? Somewhere they had made it clear that even if you, for a transfer, please confirm it, I'm just speaking from memory. If you have a transfer case pending and you join the new employer as soon as the receipt comes, then Three months later, your H-1 transfer gets denied, but the old H-1 has not been revoked. USCIS has indicated strangely enough that they will let you go back to that same employer who had originally done your H-1 as long as the H-1 is still alive. So that's in a nutshell the situation. But let's see what the questions here from Immigration 17 are. Entered the U.S. in 2011 on an H-1B. Sixth year, last employer extended the H-1B by three years with a new I-94 till 2019. So basically you must have an I-140 going, right? Because otherwise, if you entered USA on 20, in 2011, that means in 2017, your H-1 will be over. And the fact that you got it till 2019, I'm assuming you've got an I-140 approval. I left this employer, received an uh, an offer from my current employer. They submit an H-1B transfer. You joined using the receipt, well, exactly. They've got an RFE. What would happen if the transfer is denied? And the question is, if, uh, and the answer is, if the old employer still has the H-1 in play, you can join them. Would my current employer be able to file a new cap exempt H-1B petition? Yes, yes. They can. So just because their transfer is denied for whatever reason, it does not foreclose a second case being filed, but you would have to go outside USA for visa stamping. Your question is, would I have to immediately leave? And the answer is, I think that's a good idea. Immediately means within a few days, as soon as you can make arrangements. This is one of those gray areas of the law. How soon do I have to leave? Technically, you are unlawfully present and out of status. If your old I-94 is gone, the new one is denied. So if you stay here 180 days, you'll be subject to three-year bar. So it's a good, prudent idea to leave as soon as you can. But also, government can't expect you to leave within 24 hours. That's unreasonable. Okay. I think there was another question on this kind of a situation further down. Let me see if I can find it. I was looking at... There was another question on H1 transfer. I think, yeah, there it is. If I apply for H1B transfer 
and start working when I get a receipt and my current employer notifies USCIS to revoke the H-1, when will I be out of status? You'll be out of status and unlawfully present on the date your H-1 transfer is denied. Any follow-up questions on this, press star 5. No new questions, only follow-up questions. Press star 5 on your telephone, please. Okay. So let's go on to the next question. Oh, sorry, there was another set of questions about TN and Canada. We already covered these. I, I forgot about these questions, but that gentleman was also on the phone. So I guess these questions have already been answered. I want to make uh, this person arena aware. I'm sorry, we don't do DV lottery cases. We, we decided very early in the process when the DV lottery was first started that lawyers were not really needed for most of this process. So we as a firm don't do DV lottery cases. Sorry about that. Let's go on to the next frequently asked question. When is an H-1B amendment necessary? This question comes up quite a bit. As you folks know, there was, a, many of you know, there was a case called Matter of Simeo. Matter of Simeo case, Administrative Appeals Office decided that you have to file an amendment even if there is, uh, every time there is a change in job location, more than beyond normal commuting distance. But there's more to this story. This really is not something new. This has always been the law. For the last many, many years, USCIS has said, there's a regulation on the books that clearly says, anytime you have a substantial change in the job, whether it is the job location, job description, or job particulars, we expect you to file an amendment. So substantial change was always the criteria. And of course, geographical relocation was always considered to be substantial change. Matter of Simeo, I've said this before, I said it again, has left one question confused. Matter of Simeo says, every time you change your job location to an area beyond normal commuting distance, 40, 50 miles, I guess, you will have to file an amendment. But what Matter of Simeo did not say correctly, and I think ultimately over the next year, two years, USCIS will wake up and say, oh no, this is incomplete. What they, what they have not clarified is this. If I change projects of there is a change in, in between vendors, prime vendor, or even the client, or the, or the, like I said, the project, even if it is in the same building, I think you would have to file an amendment because it's a substantial change. So matter of Simeo kind of left that confused. Matter of Simeo said, if you are changing jobs within the same geographical area, you don't have to file amendment. That's incorrect. That actually is incorrect, physically incorrect. Whoever drafted the memo seems to have not taken a look at that particular situation where there's a change in the project, change in the vendor, sub-vendor, or a change in even the job description or the client, the end client. I think in those, all those cases, you will need an amendment. So it is easier to answer this question by saying when an amendment is not needed. An amendment is not needed if you are on the same project with the same hierarchy of vendor, sub-vendor, end client, etc., and the change of location is within a few miles, if it is within normal commuting distance. Then you don't need an amendment. I think filing an LCA would be enough. Let's see what your question is. If I change my address, which I included as a workplace in LCA within 50 miles and work for the same client, if it is the same project, same client, and 50 miles is considered to be normal commuting distance for that location, I don't think you need an amendment, but you should do a new LCA. How about if I change the client with the same job role and keep getting same salary, etc., no change? Change the client. I, I just answered that question. If you change the client 
in my opinion, you should do an amendment. Okay. Any follow up questions on this star five? No new questions. Any follow up? Star five, please. Okay. You can press star five on your phone. All right. Next frequently asked question is about applying for green card for parents. I want to apply for green card for my parents. They have a visitor visa. Valid for another four years. They're coming for a knee replacement surgery. First of all, I've said this before, it is important at the point when they enter the USA, they should not have a preconceived intention to file a green card because then that tourist visa entry can be fraudulent. However, once they enter after three, four months, if they change their mind, it's perfectly okay to file their I-130 and 485 adjustment of status at the same time. And usually it is done within a year. If it is done from India, maybe a year and a half, maybe a little bit more, difficult to figure out the times. Can they, can they live, can they just visit every couple of years after they get the green card? And the answer is you can get your parents to apply for a re-entry permit, which allows them to stay away for two years. You may be able to re renew it one or two times, but you won't be able to continue to do that indefinitely. If they don't live here permanently without a re-entry permit, they would lose their green card. Of course, you can apply again. Losing a green card doesn't mean you can't get it again. What is the minimum time they need to spend in the United States? They need to have their permanent home in the U.S., whatever that means. It's not a really a legal term of art. When somebody has a permanent home in the U.S., there are certain behaviors associated with it. And there's a certain severance, a certain cutting off of ties with their home country. So if those particular elements exist, then that would be sufficient. I can't give you a formula that if they stay here three months or five months or 10 months, that's enough. Their permanent home must be in the United States. Can my nephew who's 11 years old come with his grandparents? No, there is no provision like that under the law. Star five, if you have a follow-up question on this, star five. None, okay. Now, this is a slightly different situation. Getting H1 transfer while an amendment or extension is pending. So, if I have a case going already, my extension is pending, and I want to change my employers while the extension is pending, how does it work out? Well, the worst case scenario is, worst case scenario, if the transfer is approved, you may have to go outside for visa stamping. That is the worst case scenario. The best case scenario is by the time the transfer is decided, either your amendment or extension is already approved or your existing period of H1 is still valid, they will give you an H1 transfer within the United States. So if the amendment or extension is approved by the time they decide the transfer or if the, uh, what was the second, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. If it is not approved, the amendment or the extension, they can ask you to go get your visa stamping done from outside the United States. So let's look at the exact situation from Kayak, New Jersey. I'm on H1B, sixth year of H1 expiring in November 2016. Approved I-140. Current employers applied for H1 amendment due to change in work location. So they are also extending the H1. So amendment and extension, all of these are going on. Can I get an H1 transfer? And the answer is yes. Only the worst case scenario is that if your amendment or extension is not already approved, you would have to leave USA for visa stamping. Star five, if you have a follow-up question on this, star five. Okay. That finishes our frequently asked questions. Let's go to our routine questions, non-frequently asked questions. 
The first one of the routine questions is from Manav, Delhi. They want their son to continue school in the United States. Can we come and be with him on B1, B2? The child is 12 years old. And the answer is, we actually had a case very similar to this many years ago. And we were able to get the mother tourist visa on an ongoing basis for some years. So there is provision in law that might allow this situation to obtain, but there's gotta be a good reason for it. In this case, the case that I remember, the child was not only young, but they had some physical challenges. I think they had some sort of a muscular dystrophy going, so they needed help. And mother was going to stay with them. And she did stay with them for at least, I think, two, three years. And we had to keep extending the tourist visa of the mother every six months. Let's see. Since my son is 12, we as parents have to be here to look after him. I'm not sure that is as likely to work. We can try and you can try. But I think government position might be that going in, you knew that your child is going to be here by themselves. So really, what is the need for them to come and study in the United States? I don't know if this will work because the child does not have any special needs and it's not just one parent, both parents want to come. I understand that you have enough money, money is not an issue. You said you'll transfer a million dollars to the son's US bank account. You could even look at doing an investment-based green card if you have that kind of money. Think about an EB-5 kind of green card. It's gonna take a few years, even under EB-5, but at least you would have a more secure footing and the child will get a green card also. Affidavit of support, buying a house in the son's name. By the way, when you are 12 years old, you, can't, you don't have the capacity to contract. This is really a contract issue. Buying a house or other uh, contracting issues are local issues. In India, we have the same law. Uh, many countries have that same law all over the country. But in USA, contract law is different in different states. I have a family owned business, I'm one third partner. You should, if you want to actively do business in the United States, one of the things you could look at is an L1A visa, depending upon what kind of business you have. You may want to do a consultation with a lawyer, discuss your business situation in detail. Maybe an L1A is possible because if an L1A is possible, that would lead to an EB1C green card. And that is a very, very quick green card. Usually a green card under EB1C is obtainable within a year to two years. Right now, EB1 has backed up a little bit, but I expect that to change in October. So that is another thing you should look at. You should look at EB5. You should look at L1A type options. In all these options, your child comes as your dependent and they can study. And L1A allows you to come for as many days as you like or as few days as you like. We have done L1As for uh, CEOs of multinational companies who come to USA only for three days a year, their salary continues to be paid in their home country. And the reason we did L1 is because government was giving them too many hassles every time they came on a business visa. So L1A visa is a good fit for you probably if you want to buy a business in the United States, which is a branch of your Indian business. Um, I'm using the word branch rather loosely. So look into that. Star five, if anybody has a follow-up question on this, star five. Okay. Next question is from S. Mani Maran, who says, I'm a green card holder. I moved back to India in May 2014. I have a repay entry permit. I'll be applying for a second one for another two years. How can I apply for naturalization? You cannot. You have to fulfill two and a half years of physical presence in the United States, and your green card must have been obtained five years ago, 
and you must not have broken your residence uh, continuity by being outside for a year or more. So each year, if you are less than six months outside the US, it will make your naturalization easy. But two and a half years in the United States physically is important. And when you apply for naturalization, you're right, you have to move back. Your permanent home must be in the United States. One of the exceptions is for uh, employees of multinational companies who are working for a US-based employer outside USA or missionaries, if I remember correctly, uh, also for defense-related contracts, etc., or US government contracts. You should, if you have that kind of a situation, you should look into two things, N-470, N-470, as well as expeditious naturalization, expeditious naturalization. That's limited, in very limited circumstances, you can do that. But in almost all cases, you would have to live in USA and fulfill the requirements for naturalization. Star five, if you have a follow-up question. Next question is from Chummaid, who says, my sister is a US citizen, unemployed. Her permanent resident husband is well employed, wants to sponsor my parents. So the question is really about Medicare eligibility. Unfortunately, I don't have any information about insurance laws. You'll have to talk with somebody who does health insurance, like an insurance agent. That's the person who, who can tell you. Is requiring treatment abroad a valid reason for a one or two year re-entry permit? Yes, I think so. Because if the medical treatment is a lot cheaper or you rely upon it a lot better or post-operative care that you're going to get in India is better, I think that's a good reason for getting a re-entry permit. Right. Now, re-entry permit is, is, is as long as you're not just making excuses and there is a valid reason to stay away, re-entry permits are good to have. I don't see any problem with that. But the, the medical coverage, etc., you should talk with a company or, or a, an agent, insurance agent who does healthcare. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question on this, star 5. Press star 5 on your phone. Okay, let's go on to the next question. I'm currently on H1B with my employer. Pre previous employer filed for green card in 2011. I-140 is approved. Employer's lawyers told me that they will never retract the approved I-140. I want to go outside the USA with a new employer. What will happen to my priority date? Well, first of all, under the law currently, an I-140 once approved, unless revoked, is good forever. So if the job still existed and continued to exist while you were gone, you could actually take up on that I-140 and file consular processing, or if you're in the USA, file for 485, the last step of the green card, when your priority date becomes current. Your being outside USA does not directly affect your priority date. I would strongly advise you to sit with your lawyers and go over these options that I'm suggesting. Can you apply for the last step with the same employer? Does the job continue to exist? Do they still have ability to pay wages for all those years? These are the issues that your lawyers should talk to you about. Um, there is no law that you've got to have an employer and you have to file within one year, the last step of your green card, if the priority date becomes current? The answer is no, not really. And also, you can't file 485 or consular processing through just any employer. You have to file it through the sponsoring employer. If you want to change your green card over to a new employer, you can start a green card all over again from PERM onwards. And at the I-140 stage, you will inherit the priority date of the old case. But you can't transfer green cards like that just because your I-140 is approved. I, I, I hope that this clarifies the situation for you. Star five, if you have a follow-up question. Star five. 
Why? No follow up questions today. Next question is from Vaseem Ahmed. He says, at the time of interview, counselor officer asked me to submit new joint sponsor because my current joint sponsor is not sufficient income to support me. Do I have to submit my petitioner affidavit support with new joint sponsor or just new joint sponsor? Well, first of all, petitioner always has to provide their affidavit of support. If it is already on the file, you don't have to submit a new one. So petitioner should always submit their affidavit of support, even if they don't qualify. I think that's standard practice, at least in our office, that's standard practice. So if the petitioner's affidavit is already on file, you just add a new joint sponsor. But if it is, or co-sponsor, if it is not already on file, I think you should submit it from the petitioner as well. I don't think petitioner can get away from not submitting it, even if they have no money. Star five, if you have a follow-up question. Okay. So, A.R. Jung says, family 2A processing times, based on August visa bulletin, Final action dates. When can I file for adjustment of status? Okay. The way it's working right now is this. Whenever you want to figure out when can I file for adjustment of status, you should go first to the USCIS website. Okay. So when you go to the USCIS website, the right page, it tells you for the next month. So in August, they'll tell you what to do in September. They'll say, we are using the final action table from the visa bulletin. If they do that, then you use that table. If they say nothing, then you have to use the visa bulletin dates. And these dates are always for the next month. If our H-1B status expires, Okay, let's see. And I'm not sure, I, I really don't have time to read all the dates, I'll try. Planning to marry January 2017. H-1B expires in July of 2017. We don't know. We don't know what's going to happen to the visa bulletin at that time. If USCIS tells you that the final action table is what is applicable to your case, then you will use that. So we don't know what's going to happen at that time. If her H-1B status expires and you haven't filed 485, you, she cannot stay in the United States. She has to leave or she has to convert to another H-1, L-1 kind of detail. But if her six years are over, that can only be done if she has an employment-based green card going. Okay, star five, if you're on the phone, star five. All right, so we don't really know in the future how these dates are going to move and in which month USCIS is going to let us use the final action table. Next question is IGIM 17, seventh year of H1B, go till 2018. I've got two years left on my third, three year extension. My I-140 has been removed. See, when a situation like this happens, and let's say you are in last, you've done your six years, and you've got a three-year extension based upon the I-140 approval, but the I-140 is revoked, can you transfer? And it's been a very tricky issue. Government says you can't transfer because the I-140 is gone. We've said, okay, wait, don't give us new three years, but the three years that you already approved, out of which two years are still remaining, Give me those two years for transfer. We've gotten at least one approval on this argument. Somebody's case was denied. They came to us. We filed a motion to reopen. We did get two years, like in your case, they were remaining. But I can't tell you that that's their standard policy. At least I don't know of any source where they have, USCIS has specifically said that's our policy. Okay. Can a new employer file an H-1B valid till 2018? And the answer I just gave you. 
H1B will be exempt from the cap if you are eligible for the H1B. The problem is your eligibility is gone because of the I-140 vanishing. What if the I-140 is still approved and the H-1B is uh, submitted and revoked by the time it's adjudicated? You have the same problem. If the I-140 is not unrevoked or if it remains, if the H-1B is revoked anytime before approval of the H-1, USCIS can decline the approval. You can reset your six years clock and but you would not have a cap exempt H1 at that point of time because you have no time left on your six years. You don't have an I-140 through which you can come in. What you could do is this. Start a new green card, leave USA for one year. Then based upon that new green card, you would be able to get one or three years of H1, I think without there being a quota issue, if you were to come back after one year. It's an interesting interplay of several different rules, but that would work out, I think. So leave USA, but have another employer start your green card. Get subsequent extension on that green card filing, which is after one year, you'll become eligible anyway. If the I-140 is approved, three years. If the I-140 is not approved, you get one year. Okay. Star five, if you have a follow-up question. There's a, I think there are one or two issues I left here. Would the I-140 EAD rule be applied retroactively? I don't know. I don't know. We haven't seen anything on the new I-140 EAD rules. So when they come out, we'll take a look and see how they work out. I don't know how they're going to apply them. Okay. Aditya Singh wants to know, working for a consulting company, H-1B good till 2018, I-140 approved. There is a 15 employee company in India who wants me to work for them as a business partner. First of all, remember H1 is for employer-employee relationship. It cannot be for a business partner. Somebody should be able to fire you. Can they file an H1? Yes. As long as they have a, an employer identification number in the United States, they should be able to file. What are the chances of approval if the company is valid? and does not interfere with my work at my current employer. You can do a concurrent H1 through a new company. That is not a problem. I don't see any issue there. But do consult a lawyer, understand the details of your situation. Somebody should spend a few minutes with you going over all your questions and answers. I would suggest that, but theoretically at least it's possible. So uh, about the filing piece and all, I am sorry, uh, Aditya. I, my, our team keeps track of it. I'm very bad with numbers. I can figure it out, but I don't know it off the top of my head. Okay. Star five, if you have follow-up questions on this. Okay. No new questions, okay? Just follow-up questions. Um, Pennsylvania, Hello. Pennsylvania, go ahead, please. Hello? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thanks for answering my question. Sure. I have follow up question on this that, uh, uh, that as the new company is a very small company in India and uh, we will register that, uh, them in the United States here. Uh, so, what are things we need to take care of uh, while filing an H1 for this small company? No, I, I, uh, I, I, can't, I can't tell you all the details in the time that we have here. I want you to have a consultation with an attorney. Go over the details of what is involved here. But theoretically, it is possible. And especially if you're doing a concurrent H1, there's very risk, very little risk involved because don't start working on anything with them until the case gets approved. So theoretically, it is possible. The key here, Aditya, is not how big the company is. The key here is do they have professional level work for you. If they have that, you should be able to get an H1. Okay? I won't be able to go into okay. any more details. Good luck to you. Okay. Right. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Sometimes I'm a little constrained because this is a 15-20 minute conversation. I can't really cover it in the time that we have. Most cases I can answer quick questions. It's not a problem. Then, 
Here's an interesting situation from AKS 341. We've had this situation before. Somebody is born in Nepal, there's no record of birth, but you can get cross-chargeability cross advantage, what do we do? I think there are a couple of things you could do. One thing, and it, it may not be easy to do it, but I think getting a ruling from a court in Nepal could be an option. What if you got a something like a declaratory judgment that says this child was indeed born in uh, Nepal, we have interviewed witnesses. I think that might be possible. Uh, would that be acceptable? It's not going to be an easy sailing. But come on, if you can't get, we know how birth certificates in our countries are. There, there really is, especially in Nepal, there really is no mandatory requirement for it. But I think you'll have to do something from the legal side in Nepal. If you get some kind of a court process started and prove to the court satisfaction in Nepal that she was born in Nepal, that evidence might be helpful. I think that evidence would, would probably seal the deal for you. Try it, okay? Uh, any follow-up questions on this? Star 5. Follow-up questions? Star 5. Okay. Oh, there is one. All right. This is... I don't know where you're calling from. It's an anonymous call. Go ahead. I can hear you. Uh, my question is that uh, because the citizen of it, uh, her passport needs to be made, and the, the passport have uh, should have Nepal as her country visa, but uh, it is extremely difficult to get that done in India given the lack of documentation. So. If the passport has India as her birth, will that mean she cannot and I cannot claim the benefit of cross chargeability in the future? And that's why I think what it will have to it'll take a little bit of time, but what you should do is you should contact a lawyer in Nepal, see if you can get some kind of a court ruling that says she was born in Nepal, maybe even get a birth certificate made based upon that court ruling. Then take that court ruling and that birth certificate to the passport authorities in India. Get the passport done so that her citizenship is India, but her country of birth is Nepal. Then take the same evidence to US authorities and I think that will work. Okay. All right. Good luck. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. All right. Next question. I already covered that. Okay, we're done with all the posted questions. Let's start with new questions. Anyone has any question, press star 5. Anyone has any question, press star 5. Wow, nobody has any new questions today. That's interesting. Okay, well, last call, guys. Okay, one. Anyone has any question, new or old, doesn't matter. Press star 5. I've got one so far. Anyone has any question? Okay, well, then we'll just do one question and we'll be done this time. We'll see you again next to next week. Okay, you are also, I think, on a voice over IP. Go ahead, please. Oh, no, no, you're not on a voice over IP. One second. Yeah, you are on a voice over IP, I think. Go ahead. Oh, actually, the, hang on one second. One second. There's something wrong with my... Uh, there's something wrong with my dashboard. It's showing three raised hands, but I don't see people with raised hands. Huh, I see only one. Okay, let me do this. Okay, somebody's on the phone. I don't know who's on the phone. Say hello. Say hello. I think it's area code area code nine seven two. 
I can hear you. You just said Rajiv. I heard you. Hello? This is very confusing. I have three raised hands, but they don't show up on my dashboard for some reason. Hang on. Let me let me redo it. Okay. Now we have four raised hands. I see them. All right. Um, I have somebody on voice over IP. Go ahead, please. Say hello, please. You logged in at 12.53 p.m. Hello, Paraji. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Sorry about the confusion. I can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, Raji, I had emailed you before you went on. Uh, uh, you were away for a week. I okay. had a visa stamping in a third country. Uh, a visa stamping as a third country national outside of India. Oh, I remember you. Uh, and I, I had, I had, uh, I think we had talked about the section, what is it, 222G or whatever that is called. And I had told you that you can yes, go, yes. go to a third country. Yes. Uh, uh, and the uh, in, in the meantime, the attorneys, uh, my employer, uh, and in the future employer who has filed the H one B, they suggested that <coughs> uh, Mexico might give me uh, deny me uh, uh, visa stamping because out of because I was out of status in the U S for some time, so. Uh, at this point of time, uh, I, have, I have decided not to go to Mexico. Uh, the only thing that I think uh, uh, makes me, I'm waiting for visa stamping in India itself, which is about a month and a half delayed based on the appointment that I have as of now. Uh, so, <coughs> I, I was... Uh, Thinking of applying for a visitor visa in the meantime, uh, in case I can get that, um, do you think I should do that or I should not do that? Why uh, am I waiting look, for you, you have me at a disadvantage for a couple of reasons. You have a fairly lengthy history which I don't remember. Remember, I do on an average between 10 and 18, 15, 16 consultations a day. So I will not remember what right. you asked me or told me several weeks ago. And it's really legal malpractice for me to give an opinion without remembering or without knowing the facts. I don't know the facts of your case. Generally speaking, your lawyers are wrong. Just because somebody is out of status does not foreclose the option of going to a third country. Okay. And even there, even if it was foreclosed, if there are extraordinary circumstances, that can be forgiven. So I'm not going to get into an argument with you. Um, about what your lawyer said and what I'm saying. They're wrong, I'm right, you can check it online if you like. It's actually a part of, you know where you can go? You can go to university websites. Most of these Ivy League universities have a fairly lengthy write-up on these things, if the government doesn't. That would be one way, one good way to check this. First thing, and I, I, I don't remember what section of the law it is. I think it's section 222G, INA, which talks about uh, the, this uh, third country national processing. Number one. Number two, I don't know how you are in the United States. If you are accruing unlawful presence, you should be leaving. You should be leaving as quickly as possible. Should you go to a third country and try for a visa anyway? Absolutely. Why not? As long as you are upfront and truthful, what harm could there be? Maximum they can say is no. You go to India from there. Right? Oh. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm going to be able to give you about a minute more before I have to go on to other people. So let's just wrap this up. What 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 is the bottom line issue here now? The bottom line is merely that I was out of state in the U.S. for about five months okay. because of my job loss, and then I came to India. Oh, good, uh, good. That's yeah. excellent. Yeah, I don't see why you shouldn't go to, for example, you're already in India. Why can't you go to something like uh, I don't know Malaysia or Singapore? Why can't you go there? <coughs> right? Um, yeah, yeah, I was thinking of doing that. Although the website of all these consulates, they discourage people from doing that. Then, 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 then you know what they want you to do. So really, I don't have any comments about that. But theoretically, at least, all those things are possible in my opinion. Okay? I got to go on.
Okay. Good luck. Uh, guys, this situation really sucks. I wish I could do more for you folks, but unfortunately, we are all stuck with these visa waits and all. Okay, let's go to area code. What is it? This is Texas. Texas, go ahead, please. I can hear you. Area code 970. Yes. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir, I can. Go ahead, please. I'm, I'm making a follow-up question on Arjun G. I'm, I'm a green card holder. Right. And thinking of getting married in January of next year. Okay. And, and the current uh, filing, uh, family filing sponsor visa application date is 22nd of November 2015 after the last monthly statement of the uh, State Department. The question to you is, if I get married in, in January of next year, when can I legally apply for her visa or green card certified? Okay. Can I apply immediately after the marriage? Yes. Or wait until... No, no, you can apply immediately. You see, uh, I think what your question is, do I have to wait for the dates to be current before I can apply, right? Yes. Should I have to cross the date of... No, 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 no. No, no there, are, there are two components to the green card filing. Two components. Okay. One is Form I-130. Form I-130 is basically a form that is filed by you, yeah. by you for your spouse saying, I'm married to this woman, she's my wife, and I want you to, Mr. USCIS, I want you to tell me that she's eligible to receive her green card. That is a kind of a determination of an eligibility. So they decide that. Now, if somebody is in the United States, they can also, legally in the United States, if you're a US citizen, even illegally in the United States, but somebody is in the United States, they can also file the second step of the green card at the same time, uh, if their dates are current, that's, that step is called 485, adjustment of status. However, if the dates are not current, I-130 will be approved, but 485, you can't file until the dates become current. If they are outside the US, then after I-130 is approved, the file eventually through process gets sent to the consulate, and when the dates become current, she gets interviewed. Does that make sense? So, uh I can't file right away, but the eligibility will be only decided when the date becomes current. Am I correct? Well, the, the I-130 will be approved, but the second step will have to take time until the dates become current. When you say that, in other words, I can file as soon as the wedding is over, regardless yes. whether the date, yes. Yes. date, date has come, come up or not. Yes, you can. But, but the, the application would not be started until after the uh, wedding date has crossed. No, uh, no, 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 sir, that's not, that's not true. I-130 will be started, completed, dates doesn't matter. Dates matter only for the second step. Second step can be if somebody is inside the United States, adjustment of status. If somebody is outside the U.S., consular processing. That will start only when the dates become current. Okay. Okay. That is, if, if they are outside of the United States, it will only start up when the date becomes current. Even if they are inside the US, they can't do the 485 until the dates are current. So the second okay. step. Yeah. Okay. Good luck. Okay. But, but if, if, the, if the person's H1B, the vice counsel's H1B expires, she can't stay. She cannot stay. She cannot stay. She cannot stay in the United States. She cannot. No. She cannot stay in the United States. No. Not. Not. Good. Good. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you. Okay, folks. There were a couple of other hands. I guess people got tired of waiting. Sorry about that. Anybody has any questions? Start five now. I'm closing the conference today. If you folks. Okay, one more. I think this is the same individual. Uh, did you have a question? Area code 201? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, hi, you can hear me? I can hear you, yes. Uh, sir, I'm on F1 visa. I okay. got OPT extension RFE. Okay. Uh, I got all the documents. I answered to a wrong USCIS address. 
So instead of sending it to the Virginia address, I forward it to the clinic center. Okay. So what my next step gonna be? Do you have a copy of all the papers and is the date, RFE date is still uh, available? Yeah, I do have all the documents. Uh, and one more question, and I don't have the original document of RFE RFE. That's okay, that's okay. Right now, you, you when was the last date for response to the RFE? Uh, August 15th. Today is 11th. Send the package over to the correct address. A copy and attach a statement saying that sorry I posted it to the wrong address all the originals have been mm -hmm. are you with me so far send a copy to the right address with an explanation that you sent the original to the wrong address do it before, okay. before the 15th it should be in their hands tomorrow or day after tomorrow I think that will work okay sir Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot, sir. Good luck. Yeah. Okay, folks. As always, it is a great privilege and delight to be with you. I will see you again in two weeks. Thank you all. Every other Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we host um, free community conference calls. Everybody is welcome to join. Some people post questions ahead of time. You can take membership in our forums. Uh, all of the details are there on our website, immigration.com. You can take membership uh, ahead of time. And, um, you know, it's instantaneous. It happens right away. And post your questions beforehand. Or you can just log in. Uh, the phone number in all are provided, 202-800-8394, 1230 Eastern Standard Time, every other Thursday. We have uh, free apps for both Apple iOS platform for your iPhones and iPads as well as for Android. Just look for immigration.com, immigration.com, the period dot, and uh, the application should show up.